30 years have passed since one of the most tragic events in Texas history. April 19, 1993, a 51-day standoff came to a deadly end just outside of Waco. As many as 82 people, including 28 children, died. Mike Capps was a reporter for CNN that spring. He covered the story from start to horrific finish. 207, Mr. Hernandez. His voice is well known in Central Texas. One old breaking ball, deep to left. Arias has Mike Caps has been the voice of the Round Rock Express since their very first game. In fact, he's only missed six Express games in the past 23 seasons. Before he became a baseball play-by-play -play announcer and the voice of the Express, Caps was a news reporter. Mike Caps live with many from Southeast Texas to St. Louis, Missouri to Dallas to CNN. Caps covered stories all around the world. Fifteen hurricanes along the Gulf Coast, uh, sixteen space shuttle missions, including the Challenger disaster. First television reporter in the history of the state of Texas to witness an execution. One of the biggest stories he would cover would begin February the 28th, 1993. An ATF raid of the Mount Carmel compound had turned deadly. The agents were there to serve arrest and search warrants on the Branch Davidians and their leader, David Koresh, who lived at Mount Carmel. The raid quickly turned violent. Four agents were killed, 16 others were hurt. Two and a half hours later, I was standing on a McAdam Road right near the compound. I would have hoped that we'd have been there 24, 36 hours and done. After I talked to one of my FBI friends and he explained to me what had transpired and how it got to be the way it was, there was no doubt in my mind we were gonna be there a while. He would arrive in Waco and be there for more than two months. And I ain't moving. I ain't budging. I ain't scared of these people. Caps covered the siege for CNN from a makeshift studio and a travel trailer on a road not far from the compound. CNN basically worked 17 on and 7 off. It was the way they did. It was always something going on. There's a news conference at 10.30 a.m., 10, 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m. Then I'd go sit down with my FBI guys, and they would uh, translate and give me more detail than what was said during those news conferences. Due to operational safety, I cannot tell you, but I will tell you that more agents are en route. Um, over, including agents, uh, ground support personnel in excess, I would say of 150 to 200 people were involved. You just wondered if it would ever end. Like good reporters do, Caps was able to develop sources on site, sources that tipped him off on April 18th that things were about to ramp up. I got a phone call, uh, let's see, it must have been about 11.30 the night before, and it was one of my FBI buddies saying, you, you gotta get out here. At approximately 5.55 a.m. this morning, Branch Davidian member Steve Snyder was telephonically contact, contacted and advised that the FBI would begin shortly to insert tear gas into the compound. Snyder immediately hung up the phone. He was on the air that day, April 19th, at 6 a.m. At that point, the building was still intact. The FBI began to move an M60, that's a combat engineering vehicle, to the southwest corner of the compound where our agents were met with a volley of gunfire. They're punching a hole in it. You see it right there. See, they've made a massive hole in the side of that building. Then here come the tanks, punch holes in the wall, and the next thing you know, game on, man. He signed on and reported live from the scene for 10 hours that day. We had a really good vantage point, especially with a long lens on a camera. You just saw those holes punched in the side of the, of the walls and you thought nobody's going to get out of this alive. Yes, Bonnie, let, let me interrupt you just for a second. Off to the right side of the screen you can see three or four people. Apparently, it looks like federal agents out there. The Bonnie, sign. the entire roof is gone. The entire roof is gone, Mike. What else can you yes. tell us? Any uh, sign of firefighting equipment? I know. No. None whatsoever, and uh, there, there's our shot from, uh, you'll remember, Bonnie, what we refer to as farm cam. That's looking uh, from the north side into the compound. Uh, apparently the uh, north side is, is not involved yet.
but it appears the rest of the compound is filled with uh, that orange fire and acrid uh, black smoke. This fire is uh, completely out of control and still no indication, no sign that anybody is coming out. It was heartbreaking to see it end like that, knowing little children had burned to death or had been shot to death, suicides had, had taken place, uh, and the whole thing so easily could have been avoided. My processing came years later when I figured out I needed therapy. And, and, it, and it didn't come easily. Caps travels through Waco often when he visits family in North and East Texas. He admits that he rarely thinks about Mount Carmel anymore, but he does understand that being there on that fateful day helped shape who he is. I'm glad I was there looking back through 72 years that God has allowed me to be on this earth. It was a seminal moment in that it was a perspective that I needed to have to draw on in, during tragedies. Caps is not covering those tragedies anymore, but he is still using his voice to tell stories. From high above the baseball field, Mike Caps paints a picture for his listeners, just like he did on that fateful day, April 19th, 1993. 11 surviving Branch Davidian members were charged with the murders of those four ATF agents who were killed in the initial raid. None were convicted on the most serious charges, but several were found guilty of lesser charges. The Attorney General at the time, Janet Reno, later said she regretted authorizing that initial raid. In 2000, it was determined the U.S. government did not cause the fire, although many still disagree with that independent report.